hello! My name is Mara and welcome to Books Like Whoa! Today I want to do a little shout out, a little burst of positivity, a uh, love fest into the world for the concept of summer reading for school. Now I have talked in the past, I think I did a video last summer, saying that like the idea of reading different books in the summer than you do the rest of the year as an adult is a little lost on me because I'm such a mood reader and I don't I know some people genuinely do read differently based on the season and that's just not a thing for me. But um, the thing I do understand is that if you are a young adult or if you are a uh, school aged person, you often have to do some summer reading. So uh, I'm not sure how this is in every country, but at least here in the States, um, it's pretty typical for students pre-university level uh, to have to do some reading in the summer in anticipation for their coming school year. So oftentimes everybody in a particular grade will be assigned one book and then maybe they have to pick like three others from a list or maybe they have to read a certain number of pages in the summer and like sign off that they read them or whatever like there's oftentimes some like required summer reading and I think that there's some hand-wringing about whether or not this should be a thing um, because I think a lot of people feel like if you do not like reading that this is making reading a chore and something that maybe makes you more resistant to reading anything um, and that's an argument that I'm sympathetic to and can understand but I think I want to come out today in praise of summer reading um, because I do think the upside of summer reading is that it can push you out of your comfort zone while teaching you how to pick books that you like. So um, I want to talk a little bit about that and then I'll give you some examples of summer reading that I really loved. So I think that, um, again, I do understand the idea of like if you make reading something that people have to do, it could potentially diminish their, uh, the chance of them becoming somebody who reads because they want to read. That being said, I think that that might be true for a certain personality type, but I think that there is a chance that summer reading can give some structure to, um, to young people reading uh, for school, so like there is a requirement ultimately that they're going to have to do this in school, but they're also getting the ability to kind of learn how to pick books for themselves with some structure. So most of the reading lists that I know of, or like summer reading that I know of, consist of like, okay, everybody, um, you're going into ninth grade, everybody over the summer has to read To Kill a Mockingbird, maybe, and then you also have to read four books from this list. You can pick any four books, whatever you want, but like you have to read four of them and then you have to write like a one, like a five paragraph essay about each book, something like that. And I think because they are having to read, um, it gives them the opportunity to pick books for themselves so that if they're not normally readers, um, they are getting some autonomy and ability or some agency in choosing what they're going to read, but it's within certain structures. So again, I mean, I see the pros and cons, but I think for me, I read a few books from summer reading lists that I don't think I would have read otherwise, and I ended up really enjoying them. Uh, so I think that that, was one thing. The other thing I do think is, you know, positive or could be positive is the idea of everybody having to read something over the summer and then coming back and having a discussion about it. Now I think that's particularly helpful at a collegiate level. Like I do think that it's cool when they have like incoming freshmen, they all have to read the same book and then go to a book club about it. Um, because it just gives you like kind of an icebreaker when you're meeting new people and making new friends. So at university that's a pretty common thing, at least here in the States, of like a common read coming into the year. Um, often they're like kind of thematically picked. So like, um, especially with all the like Black Lives Matter movements happening, um, I know a lot of universities have been picking things like The Hate You Give or Between the World and Me or a number of different titles. And it does, I think, first of all, like give, like it's good to pick something of the moment for people to read. But even more so, like I said, I think it potentially could give students like a little bit of an icebreaker as they're in these book clubs and they're trying to make new friends and at least they have something that they're all uh, have in common that they can talk about. So that's my like mild defense of summer reading. I can totally see the other side of it, but for me at least, I think that it is an institution worth preserving in that respect. And then a few examples of summer reads that I had um, that were really, some of these were like really formative reads for me. And I'm not gonna say that I would never have read them, but the fact that I got school credit for it, it, it incentivized me 
to get to them um, in a way that maybe would have taken me longer or I just never would have if I didn't have that incentive. So I wanted to tell you a few of those, um, especially if you are a student still and you are needing to figure out what you're gonna do for your summer reading, here's some of the ones that I enjoyed. So if any of these are on your list, I think that they could be good options for you. Probably my all time favorite summer read was The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. This was a book I was required to read uh, between my sophomore and junior year in high school because I was doing AP US history as a junior. I love that book. So it's sort of a weird book to love because it is brutal. It's essentially like a fictionalized account of the immigrant plight in meatpacking plants um, in Chicago. It actually was a super, the reason we read it for a history class is that it like legit changed regulations around food safety um, and uh, opened up some discussions about immigration in the US. Like it was a really impactful book at the time. Um, but I actually like, I found it very moving. Um, I thought that it was really like, I mean, it's very graphic cause it's like, shit gets real. Um, but it was just like super interesting. I think I found it fascinating. I think it was one of the first books that it really helped me understand how novels can be read as a part of history. I mean, that was the project of that particular class, obviously, um, because it was for a history class. But I think it really connected the dots for me of like, oh, okay, you know, certain novels really are a part of their historical time in a way that is um, beyond just being a work of fiction, but also really can be read as a historical text. So um, I think that was sort of a connection that really got cemented for me. And I also just super enjoyed it. Now, part of it is because I read it right after The Grapes of Wrath and fucking hated it. So if that is one of your options, I would steer you away from it, but to each their own. I know some people love that book. But yeah, The Jungle was probably my favorite summer read. A couple of uh, fantasy, uh, young young adult fantasy reads, or really maybe like middle grade fantasy reads that I know that I read for summer reading and are like one of these is one of my all time favorite series. Um, A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lingle. I love that book. I didn't continue in the series with that one, but that is a wonderful, wonderful book. And I do remember reading it for summer reading. So I think that's a great option if that's on your list. And then The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, which uh, I think I ended up reading that maybe in like fifth grade and absolutely loved it. It's one of my all time favorite series, maybe right behind Harry Potter. I mean, I'm not original in that respect, but like I absolutely adore that series. I've read it like countless times through. And yeah, I definitely remember reading that for summer reading and like falling in love and reading all of the books. Another kind of younger pick, I would say this is probably like maybe middle grade or like middle school age read was Catherine Called Birdie. And I can't remember the author's name right now, but I remember absolutely loving that book. It was about a young woman in medieval England, I believe, or France and in medieval Europe. Um, and it was just sort of like her story. And I don't remember exactly why that was so compelling to me but I remember I read that as well as a few other of the people in my grade and we all absolutely loved it and tried to read other books by that author because we enjoyed that book so much so yeah I think Catherine Called Birdie is kind of a, a young adult classic um, that I'm not sure if it's, if it's still on reading list but I remember really liking that one and I also just remembered that I remember loving this is an elementary school read like a, a, a young reader um, this is like a chapter book kind of read. Um, the Island of the Blue Dolphins, I believe by Scott O'Dell, because I remember he wrote a ton of books for that age range. But I remember loving that book and being fascinated by it as sort of like a survival narrative. I feel like there's a lot of those. Like, I feel like Avi um, kind of wrote some of those too. There's a lot, or like, um, oh, what is it? The Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Like there's a lot of sort of um, middle grade chapter book, young adult, like survival narratives that get put on reading lists a lot. Um, and I think this is probably my favorite of those, The Island of the Blue Dolphins. I remember just loving like how she like made all her stuff. And yeah, I remember really liking that book. So I would recommend that one too. And then I would say my final two picks were ones that I read in high school. And I would call these ones that I had been interested in reading and having them on the summer reading list incentivized me to go ahead and actually read them. And I'm so glad I did because both of these are two of my all time favorite things I've read. One of which was, uh, I think the only thing required to read was The Hound of the Baskervilles by um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Like that was the actual thing on the reading list as an option. But because I read and loved that, I read the entirety of the Sherlock Holmes short story oeuvre that summer. Um, I think that was my 
my summer going into senior year. Um, and I absolutely love those. Those were really formative for me. Um, I think they set me up for when I discovered Agatha Christie a couple years later in college and like glommed her. And obviously that's been very influential on my reading in general. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love those stories. I mean, in terms of, I, I probably do like Agatha Christie short stories slightly better, but like I totally get why some people would prefer the Doyle ones. And I think they're pretty much like the second best like mystery short stories that have ever been written. And they're, I mean, they, they form the genre. They're just like so important. And I'm really glad I got the push to read them when I did, because I think, I think the value of reading classics um, in given genres is that you understand the innovations and kind of the the formula tweaks that happen thereafter. So if you can read, especially I think this is the value of kids, honestly, reading some of these classics, if you can read the foundational text first, then I think it sets you up really well to like see how the genre evolves and like enjoy some of the ways that tropes get played with. Um, I'm not saying that's the only way to read it, but I'm personally glad that especially in the mystery genre, um, I did like kind of start a lot of my mystery reading with some of the foundational texts because I think that that has helped me be a better mystery reader in terms of like finding interesting things and um, and new new innovations on the genre and um, appreciating the kind of where it came from. And on a similar note, <laughs> I also read the foundational text for the fantasy genre uh, in high school, and that is The Lord of the Rings. So um, I think, so The Lord of the Rings movies were coming out when I was in high school. The first one came out when I was in, in either eighth or ninth grade. The second one came out when I was in either ninth or 10th grade. And the last one came out when I was in either 10th or 11th grade. I can't quite remember the timing of that, but um, they were coming out as I was in high school. And so I had tried to read Fellowship of the Ring when I was in middle school after I read The Hobbit and like totally struck out with it. But after I saw the movie, I was like, oh, I really want to read the book. So like the movie plus then I saw it on my summer reading, I'm sure to cap, they were capitalizing on the fact the movies were coming out. Um, I was like, oh, okay, great. This is a great time to get through these and to get school credit. And Lord of the Rings is one of my all time favorite books. Again, I'm so glad that I read that kind of seminal work of fantasy literature so early in my life because I think that has made me a much more discerning reader about fantasy and maybe that's the downside because I think it's ruined some kind of what I would describe as basic bitch fantasy um, where there's not a lot of innovation on the Tolkien formula happening but I think the fact that I know what that original formula looked like was really helpful in me kind of like being a better reader in that genre so I would definitely recommend Lord of the Rings as a great thing for young people to read especially if they like fantasy like read it early on so that you can be a more discerning basically reader of um, the degree to which people are actually doing something new with those tropes as opposed to just sort of rehashing them. That's just my personal opinion. You know, that's that's my my take on how we should be forming the uh, literary palettes of young people. But obviously many people would disagree with that. So yeah, so that's my sort of like case for summer reading. Like I said, I can definitely see the argument against but I personally had a really good experience with summer reading. So I wanted to like be a little bit of an advocate for it. And I did want to just give some ideas in case you are somebody who needs to do some summer reading. Those are some kind of like perennial uh, faves of the summer reading list that I know show up a lot. And I personally would endorse any of those as options for you. But I would say, you know, if you're ever confused about what you should read for summer reading, like look around booktube, see if you can find some reviews, go talk to your librarian. They will like, they will absolutely love to talk to you about what they think you might enjoy in a summer read. So if you take your list to your local librarian, they will happily talk and figure out like what might be some good options for you. Or you can go to your local bookstore because especially if you go to a smaller one, a lot of them will have read a lot of them and I'm sure would have some feedback or thoughts about ones that you might enjoy. So yay summer reading. Uh, even if you hate it, you still have to do it. So hopefully this has energized you to uh, to approach it with an air of um, enjoyment instead of dread. But anyway, those are my thoughts. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social meets if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, and I think that will do it. I hope you're having a really lovely day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye!